it's so terrific to see friends, friends from across 30 years now, and to have you assembled here again, coming together again. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Danielle Allen, the current director of the Edmund J. Stafford Center for Ethics, and I'm delighted to welcome you and to launch our program today. To see you all assembled here is something like the marvel of Genesis. <laughs> In the beginning, in 1976, in the years after Watergate, there was a university president, Derek Bach, who had the wisdom to marry a moral philosopher. Sisla, thank you for being here. The time after Watergate was a lot like our own. President Bach wrote in a 1976 essay about moral education that Americans have few rivals in their willingness to talk openly about ethical standards. They are preached in our churches, proclaimed by public officials, debated in the press and discussed by professional societies to a degree that arouses wonder abroad. Yet there has rarely been a time when we have been so dissatisfied with our moral behavior or so beset by ethical dilemmas of every kind. Some of these problems have arisen in the backwash of the scandals that have recently occurred in government, business, and other areas of national life. Others are the product of an age when many new groups are pressing claims of a distinctly moral nature, racial minorities, women, patients, consumers, environmentalists, and many more. Plus ça change. The problem Bach saw was not the absence of moral discourse, but its undisciplined character. A widespread proclivity to windy opining and sententious pronouncements, either censorious or banal. What could replace the flabby self-important proclaiming? Formal education, he thought, and moral reasoning. The country also needed broad dissemination through the culture of related standards of reasoning, and clearer and more imaginative thinking about how legal and regulatory frameworks can alter our moral behavior for the better. Harvard, he decided, would lead the way. So first there were Derek and Sisla, then came the deans. President Bach put a proposal to the deans that Harvard should establish a central program that would be the locus of university-wide efforts in ethics teaching and curriculum development. The deans voted unanimously. This was the miracle the let there be light moment. According to a history of the center, the deans supported the proposal because they were prepared to accept two principles. One was the need to emphasize ethics in the curricula, if, in, if not in all, then most of the faculties at Harvard. And the second was that they recognized that conventional methods of training faculty didn't provide all the knowledge that you needed to function successfully in teaching practical ethics. They didn't have any illusions, though, about what could be accomplished. Formal education, President Bach wrote, will rarely improve the character of a scoundrel. <laughs> but many individuals who are disposed to act morally will often fail to do so because they are simply unaware of the ethical problems that lie hidden in the situations they confront. By repeatedly asking students to identify moral problems and define the issues at stake, courses in applied ethics can sharpen and refine their moral perception so that they can avoid these pitfalls. After Derek and Sisla and the deans came Dennis. Political philosopher Dennis Thompson, stolen from Neil Rudenstein at Princeton. We're glad that you're here today. Thank you, Neil. You're very forgiving. <laughs> we appreciate it. Dennis joined the Harvard faculty in 1986 to try to bring Derek's vision to life. He says that when he, was, when he came, there was little going on in practical ethics. He spent the first year looking here and there learning lessons in role morality as he took turns as entrepreneur, talent scout, missionary, impresario, soothsayer, and panhandler. If the center didn't work out, he told Derek he'd do well in Harvard Square, he was sure. <laughs> By his own report, Dennis was also poobah for the Mikado, ready to combine all his roles and make a request that emanated from his needs as a whole person. He needed more faculty alongside him. The genie delivered, but with an odd requirement. Those sent to join Dennis in various stints as director if not bearing a name starting with D, otherwise had alliterative names. Martha Minow, Arthur Applebaum, and Larry Lessig. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> and I also need to introduce Ezekiel Emanuel. In 1987, Derek, the deans, and Dennis begat the first class of faculty fellows, including Ezekiel and Arthur. The rest, as they say, is history. One class begat another, and then begat also classes of graduate fellows, and then thanks to Eric Beerbaum, classes of undergraduate fellows, and then under Larry Lab fellows, we now have an alumni network of over 500 former fellows. These former fellows have themselves disseminated and expanded the work. 
More than 15 fellows have been appointed to faculty positions at Harvard and have developed the ethics programs in the professional schools. As many of you know, former fellows also began their own centers elsewhere. Amy Gutman at Princeton, Elizabeth Kish did so at Duke, and Melissa Williams at Toronto. We helped establish a sister institution, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Tel Aviv University, and we took the lead in creating the first international association devoted to ethics in public life, the Association for Practical and Professional Ethics. It now has more than 700 members, representing 104 institutions and ethics centers in the US and 14 foreign countries. In 2009, when Larry Lessig took over the directorship, he expanded the area of inquiry focused on institutional incentive structures. The project on institutional corruption produced hundreds of publications and seeded several ongoing projects that are grounded in the big idea that institutions deserve greater normative scrutiny and empirical analysis oriented towards constructive reform. Among those working on corruption at the federal level is yet another honored guest this weekend, Richard Painter, who served as w George W. Bush's ethics lawyer and is now investigating conflicts of interest in the current administration. Foundational to the success and durability of all this work was the support of early funders, including the American Express Foundation, Lester Kissel, and Eugene Beard. And of course, then, there was the naming endowment from the Edmund J. Safra Foundation. We are thrilled to have Mrs. Lily Safra here with us today honorary fellow in the center. Philanthropy is an art, and she is among its finest practitioners. Her philanthropic methods have activated our potential to achieve more than we might have imagined for ourselves, while always gently reminding us of the high standards to which we should aspire. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> but where do we find ourselves now? In Dennis's third year, he testified before the U.S. House of Representatives' bipartisan task force on ethics. He reported about this to Derek. He wrote, I can report that ethics commands the attention of more people in high places than ever before. Alas, the motives for this interest are not always the most noble. Quote, file a charge against your opponent before the ethics committee to leave a cloud hanging over his head. End quote. And the conception of ethics, De Dennis wrote, are not always the most edifying. Again, quote, no one learns his ethics in Congress. All I really need to know, I learned in kindergarten, end quote. And then Dennis wrote, former Congressman Otis Pike did concede that we could stand to learn something more about ethics. Quote, we don't know how to define ethics, and we aren't sure whether the word is singular or plural. Dennis's lessons on that occasion yielded fruit, at least in the short term. The task force created an office of advice and education within the House Ethics Committee. They got the message. But of course, this year on January 2nd, 2017, we all woke to the headline with no warning, House Republicans vote to gut independent ethics office. The office had been established in 2008 to strengthen the work of the House Ethics Committee. But you'll remember the backlash from ethics experts and the general public. It was swift and severe. The House had to reverse course on this effort to reduce the rigor and discipline of their own practices. Thus, we see both the success and the fragility of Derek Bach's original vision. It's reasonable to think that the public and leading authorities responded so quickly, in part thanks to dissemination of an understanding about ethics standards, one that has grown out of this center and its allies. Yet Congress hoped to walk away from the high standards that the public has, in fact, come to adopt. So the work is far from done. Looking to the complex present and daunting future, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics is currently redoubling efforts to strengthen and expand the ethics curriculum at Harvard, to understand and support ethics curricula on campuses nationally, and to support efforts to reinvigorate civic education, especially in context of diversity. We also continue to pursue solutions to badly aligned structural, institutional, and organizational incentives. And we're working to expand the purview of all these discussions to a global context. With this conference and panel participants drawn from our remarkable alumni, director, and faculty ranks, we hope to showcase the three core dimensions of our work. Research and philosophic inquiry around the most challenging questions, for instance, the end of life, Innovative, innovative pedagogy that seeks to equip young people to meet a high standard of ethical responsibility in their chosen careers, as in the panel on preparing for leadership. And third, we hope to model thoughtful engagement on ethical moder matters with broad audiences outside the academy, hence the panel on engaged universities, where President Faust will join us. Each of these topics was also addressed in the very first year of the center's life. So the problems we tackle are permanent so too is our responsibility for addressing them to the best of our ability. 
It's my pleasure now to introduce the university's provost, Alan Garber. Provost Garber is a distinguished physician and health economist. To be precise, he's the, the Malincrot, I don't think I've said that right exactly, Malincrot Professor of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School, a professor of economics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, professor of public policy in the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. In other words, he's indispensable. Provost Garber, though, it must be said, did graduate from Harvard College before President Bach and Dennis Thompson got to work on lifting up the level of the university instruction and ethics. We won't hold this against him. <laughs> He's a model of integrity, imagination, leadership, and good judgment, and we're very lucky to have him at the helm. Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle, for that very gracious introduction and for, that, um, for your remarks in general. For the part of our comments that didn't overlap, I learned a lot. <laughs> I, and what I really, one of the things I learned is of great practical value. And this is one of the great things about the Software Center. You learn things you don't expect to. I've learned I need to think more about alliteration as a criterion for hiring <laughs> center directors. But I have to say, one of the, the best recruitments I've ever made was to the one non-alliterative director, <laughs> you. So, <laughs> so we are just delighted that you agreed to come back to Harvard and to serve in this role, uh, already with tremendous distinction. I want to welcome all of the rest of you, the faculty, fellows, the students, the staff, former fellows of the center, and friends of the Software Center who have joined us here today. And I do want to give a very special welcome to Neil Rudenstein, former president, uh, to Derek, who will be, Derek Bach, who will be joining us later, another former president, and especially to Mrs. Lily Safra, chairman of the Edmund J. Safra Foundation, primary benefactor of the center, and as I think Danielle mentioned, the sole honorary fellow of the Safra Center. Danielle referred to an article that Derek wrote uh, back in 1976, actually the year I received my degree. <laughs> uh, and in that article that she quoted, he said something else about the time there. There has rarely been a time when we have been so dissatisfied with our moral behavior or so beset by ethical dilemmas of every kind Society's faith in its leaders has declined precipitously in recent years. Derek was never given to overstatement, so he very wisely did not say we've hit bottom. <laughs> he went on to note that over the preceding decade, the proportion of the public professing confidence in Congress dropped from 42 to 13%. In major corporate presidents, from 55 to 19 percent. In doctors, from 72 to 43 percent. And those of you on the law faculty, you're not exempt. And in leaders of the bar, from 46 to 16 percent. Most vexing, he remarked, was the finding that more than two thirds of the public agreed with the statement that. Over the past 10 years, this country's leaders have consistently lied to the people. Of course, that was after the Watergate era. And uh, when Derek said this, as Danielle indicated, he was really making the case for the university's res responsibility to teach applied ethics. He rejected the arguments that such teaching would inevitably be ineffective. The claims were that on the one hand, it, that, that the, the, uh, the instruction would not change behavior, and on the other hand, it would be so prescriptive, the content of the teaching would be so prescriptive, that it would be inconsistent with the values of the university. He was concerned that very few universities actually specialized in ethics, and that the deep insights of philosophers were rarely applied to practical problems. And furthermore, he was concerned that professors, professionals outside the academy had little or no training in ethics. 
He thought that bringing multiple perspectives together would be uniquely effective in uh, addressing these problems. What's changed since then? And it would be facile to say that nothing has changed. Our views of governance have changed in the US and in the world. Technology has altered our world in ways that very few people in 1986 could even have, uh, or 1976 could even have imagined. We've made surprising progress, I would argue, in some areas, and surprisingly little progress in others. As the world has shifted, I would argue that the need for a focus on ethics, if anything, is much greater. Fortunately, the establishment of the center that we're celebrating today has been an important part of the change that has occurred since Derek wrote those words. The, Safra, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics has long addressed the challenges that Derek identified. It began its life in 1986 as the program in ethics and the professions. And as Danielle indicated, it occurred when Derek managed to recruit Dennis Thompson from Princeton. And at the time, this organization represented not only uh, a new center in some sense or a new program, but something else that was more generally important. It was the first interfaculty initiative at Harvard University. This means a lot to me. <laughs> because all of the interfaculty initiatives at the university report to the provost. At the time, there was no provost. Uh, maybe that was the limiting factor. Who knows? <laughs> but it brought together faculty from Harvard's many schools to address these major problems. And it could not possibly have succeeded if it were not for the commitment of Dennis as its first leader, of President Bach, as well as his colleagues in the president's office and of the deans, which uh, Danielle recounted so well. And here's another lesson I learned. Uh, there's a lot that's changed about university governance <laughs> since the center was, uh, since the program was created. But the, in addition to the, if you will, moral support and intellectual support for the centers, the business school, for the program, the business school, the law school, the med school, and the Kennedy School provided substantial financial support for its creation. And following Derek's tenure, Neil, Larry Summers, and Drew Faust all continue to play key roles in supporting the Software Center and its work. One of the things that's notable and that Danielle referred to is the set of extraordinary people who became part of the center since its inception. And you think about, for one important example, the philosophers who were part of it. John Rawls, Amartya Sen, Tim Scanlon were all deeply, deeply involved in the center from its very beginning. And then the faculty fellows were another remarkable group. As Danielle noted, two of those original fellows are on a panel that will be uh, following shortly, Zeke Emanuel and Arthur Applebaum. And here I just have to interject that looking at the calendar, I realized that Zeke became a faculty fellow uh, just a couple of years after he was my medical student when I was a resident at the Brigham. My role was to supervise Zeke, and for those of you who know Zeke, you can imagine <laughs> how successful I was. <laughs> Fortunately, he made all of us better. Uh, in addition, Francis Cam, who is here today, was another, is another intellectual giant who was a faculty fellow just a few years after Arthur and Zeke. Something as important as the center and with its scope of work could not possibly succeed without the extraordinary generosity of many people. The center has received many gifts over the past 27 years from Eugene Beard in support of its work, especially its fellowships. He's one of the center's earliest contributors and made possible the center's first graduate, named graduate fellowships. There were other major gifts from the estate of Lester Kissel, from the American Express Foundation, and the estate of Wallace Gardner. There's ongoing support that has begun um, 
in prior years from John Casey, Michael Cooper, Richard Joffe, and Daniel Steiner. And of course, I would like to thank the Edmund J. Safra Center's primary benefactor, Mrs. Lily Safra, who has been a constant friend of the center over the years, for nearly 20 years. I am deeply grateful for your generosity and vision. The center also would not have succeeded without the vision of its directors over the years. Each one of them has been a tremendous success. Dennis was just the right person to establish the center. His extraordinarily, extraordinary diplomatic skills, I know, had to have been um, just what was needed at the time, having had experience with creating interfaculty initiatives. I have a perspective on what it's like to create something that brings people together across the university. And Dennis did an amazing job at that. But it was also his intellectual leadership that brought people together and his general ability to identify and to nurture talent. He brought the center to solid ground at the very beginning and set out a model that, as you've heard, was later replicated nationally and internationally. Lawrence Lessig, who is also here today, was the second director, he took the helm in 2010. He identified a key theme that would be the major focus of the center during his time. And he focused on what was the major threat, most pressing threat to our democracy, institutional corruption. He addressed this issue in a dedicated fashion for five years through a lab that he created called the Institutional Corruption Lab which drew scholars and researchers from a range of disciplines, not only within the university, but from academia generally and from outside academia. Much of that important work is still ongoing. I'm also grateful to both Arthur Applebaum and Martha Minow for their service as interim directors. They were more than just interim directors. They put their own stamps on the center in important and very productive ways. I learned a lot about the history of the Software Center actually when I led the search for its third director. And as I said, I was thrilled that Danielle agreed to take on this responsibility. When she chose to become center director, she decided to affirm the, the uh, center's roots as a place that brought together people from around the university and beyond and also to continue elements of the themes, of the thematic elements that had characterized Larry's ambitious program. She's now, she's only been here for under two years as center director, and she's wrapping up the second year of her diversity, justice, and democracy initiative and preparing for a transition to a theme of political economy and justice, which will be the focus for the next two years. This could not be a more timely topic, and this shift reflects her close working relationship with the center's faculty advisory committee, which she has relied upon heavily and helps guide the center's activities. In drawing together faculty, students, and others from across the university, as well as fellows from around the world, the Safra Center truly epitomizes the idea and practice of one Harvard. It convenes talent from across the university and helps ensure that the institution is greater than the sum of its parts. There is a hunger for such activities and the Edmund J. Safra Center is the most prominent example of how this can work across a wide range of views. And the real interest in working with colleagues from different disciplines. It's provided a framework that has succeeded and is replicated over and over again in other places. It continues to be an invaluable resource for specialists, but at the same time, it provides an important intellectual home to anyone with a desire to make the world a better place. In that 1976 article, Derek concluded that instruction in ethics was likely to enable students to, and I quote, become more alert in perceiving ethical issues, 
more aware of the reasons underlying moral principles and more equipped to reason carefully in applying these principles to concrete cases? Will they behave more ethically? We may never know, but surely the experiment is worth trying, for the goal has never been more important to the quality of the society in which we live. His words resonated then, and they resonate now. We can all take tremendous gratification in knowing that the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics was the experiment to which Derek referred. Its audience has been students, the entire Harvard community, and the world. Thirty years after the start of this experiment, a short time in the long life of this university, but a long time for an experiment, we can declare it a success. It says a great deal that Harvard's first interfaculty initiative was devoted to ethics, a recognition of the importance of its task and the need to marshal the intellectual resources of the entire university community. May the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics thrive for as long as it continues to provide insight into the ethical issues that are at the heart of humanity. Thank you. We're being recorded? No, we're, be, we're, we're being ampli we're being amplified. We are being recorded up there. Oh, <laughs> amplified. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, hello and uh, welcome. Uh, I'm not going to spend time introducing um, our panelists because I think they're rather well known to you. Instead, I'll just say a few embarrassing things about them and maybe about me. Uh, my dear colleague, Francis Cam. Uh, was, of course, in the third class of fellows, and uh, I, I was quite a young pup then and was a little unsure about just what it was that I was trying to become. And I remember Francis once kind of walked on the street, on Winthrop Street, and explaining myself to you, and you said, oh, now I understand, Arthur, you're a philosopher Monquet. <laughs> um, and that, that was the, one of the moments when I was, oh, yes, that's right, and I, I don't want to remain that forever. So really, Francis, thank you for that. Francis <laughs> has co-taught with me for many years the graduate fellow program, um, co-taught of course because really she was teaching me. And anyone who's had an experience with Frances knows that when she arches an eyebrow and she says, I don't understand, um, you know what's coming. Um, so <laughs> thank you Frances for being here. Uh, Zeke and I were, as you heard in the first class of faculty fellows, of course, we just hit the jackpot. What, a, what an amazing stroke of luck. We were, of course, postdocs, or not even postdocs. We were almost postdocs. Uh, poor Dennis couldn't find really good applicants in the very first year. And of course, ever, ever, ever since I was helping Dennis pick the faculty fellows, and there's no way that I would have picked me as a faculty, Zeke I would have picked, but there's no way I would have picked me as a faculty fellow. So that was an, an amazing act of grace on the part of the center. And um, I, I actually, though we were only together for one year, I, I really think I began to learn how to argue philosophically from you. And I think that after Dennis, the two of you have really helped more than anyone else, helped me on my road to stop being a philosopher monkey and actually tried to be an actual one. Um, I used to, um, and my mother, by the way, something you don't know, Zeke, was, was very much taken with you. Um, <laughs> My, my now, now departed uh, at the time, eventually very elderly mother, and I, I'd, I'd call her up and we'd have the following conversation. Hi, Ma. How come you don't call? 
And we, then we start talking about things. And then she say, oh, Arthur, I saw your friend Zeke on TV last <laughs> night. <laughs> How come I never see you on TV? <laughs> So, Zeke, you have loomed large. Um, we're going to try to have a conversation. Uh, uh, it will it'll, we'll simulate an informal conversation. It's not actually informal because um, w at least one of my panelists wants to know what the questions were going to be for beforehand. And so, without saying who it was, I gave her the questions beforehand. <laughs> and, you know, she being a very meticulous person, I think, has prepared answers for the questions. So. Um, this will be not quite as informal as it might be, but of course, uh, going back to the very first thing that, that Derek said, we don't simply want to talk about ethics. We actually want to offer arguments, and so perhaps we'll be able to do that. Um, I'm going to start by asking Zeke a question. Uh, and the, the format here is I'll ask somewhat lengthy questions, and then we'll have an answer, and then we'll open it up between the two panelists, and then I'll ask uh, another question. So, so Zeke, you. you um, wrote a uh, magnificently provocative uh, Atlantic magazine article, Why I Hope to Die at 75. Um, and you disarmingly pose it as, as your particular view about your, your life. These are your preferences. But of course, I say disarmingly because the reasons that you gave were not just idiosyncratic to one particular brother, Emmanuel. The reasons you gave were you know, ob objective reasons that presumably would apply to all of us. And the reasons you gave were that inev inevitably we will decline and be diminished o over time as we age. Um, inevitably we will start to be disabled. Um, we will, uh, for most of us, become a burden to our children who, if we live long enough, will themselves enter early middle age, and that kind of crowds them out. And uh, both for our sakes and for our children's sakes, we don't want to be remembered as uh, diminished and enfeebled. We want to be remembered in, as our most you know, as vigorous uh, moments. And um, again, you say, you're very clear. You say, this is just for me, not for anyone else. I wouldn't impose this on anyone else. But again, these are, I think, you intend these to be reasons for, if not everyone, for most people. So, so my question for you, Zeke, is um, do, is it not true um, that you are committed to the view that for, for most, most lives at least, an elderly life is really not worth living, uh, and therefore someone who disagrees with you would be making some kind of moral mistake about what is objectively good and bad about life. Yes. <laughs> um, first, I want to actually uh, pause to, um, I'm here because of Dennis, literally here, because uh, Dennis uh, uh, asked me to come, and I would not miss a celebration of the great center uh, uh, that he started uh, um, if invited. Uh, but I'm also here because of Dennis, because that year, 1987-88, in which Arthur and I grew up together, uh, was literally pivotal in uh, moving my actual career and my thinking about many, many uh, things. Um, and I uh, will say that it I've said this many times, but Dennis was an unbelievable and has remained an unbelievable mentor throughout my life. I think he said he was a little puzzled when I first said that, but uh, he is this wonderful, he's not just a talent spotter, he's also a talent nurturer. And uh, it is really, really important that what he does is bring out the best in whoever he uh, I, uh, adopts. And so I want to just say uh, thank you. I also want to say thank you to Francis. Um, this is mighty early for Francis. Um, it's the middle of the night. I, as far as I, I, I was trying to debate, did you not go to sleep or did you just wake up? Um, Frances, when she was a fellow, wanted to see something about the emergency room. I happened to be an intern working in the emergency room and I offered to have her come in uh, one day when I was working. She said, no, no, no. Um, do you ever do a night shift? <laughs> So uh, she uh, spent the whole night with me in the emergency room and saw uh, what uh, being a doctor was like. I don't know if it changed No, what, what being a doctor like you was like. No, <laughs> <laughs> Appropriate qualification. That's why I stopped. Um, but yeah, Arthur, I take it that your question, uh, I mean, the simple answer is when we do make an engage in discussion, we are trying to persuade the other person that whatever we're arguing with them is not simply our subjective view, but that it is uh, the right way to look at the world. We may fail in that, and we may be wrong. Uh, but uh, I take it that part of what we want to do is to uh, persuade others 
uh, to look at the world the way we've seen it and what the arguments uh, there are. Um, and I, I, I actually don't think uh, it's a matter of you know, um, preference about which chocolate is better. I actually do think that there are some objective criteria about the quality of chocolate, just like there are wine and ice cream and uh, olive oils and all that other stuff. Um, and I think that part of what you're trying to do is make your case. And so the Atlantic article, which I will say for those of you who have ever written for a journal like the Atlantic, you don't choose the title. I actually <laughs> had a very, very long argument with the editor about the title. I did not like it, uh, still don't like it. Um, uh, but he basically, he literally said, he didn't basically said, F you, uh, editors choose titles and authors don't. Um, and uh, uh, he then went on to the New York Times. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, l let me just say a word about, uh, I, and I think, Arthur, you captured it reasonably well. And I would say a different way of my making the point is um, a meaningful life. I think is composed of three things, meaningful work, meaningful relationships, and avocational interests. And the avocational interests, I think there are two types. There may be more types, but uh, roughly speaking in my head, there are games and non-games. Um, and uh, games are you know, the usual games, uh, the ones I hate, like crossword puzzles, uh, um, you know, video games. Um, and then there are non-games, uh, uh, lots of hobbies. Um, engaging in experiences, um, making high quality the world's best chocolate, which I will be doing this summer. Um, though, and, and it seems to me that you know, if you look at, again, the data, the meaningful work has a very clear uh, trajectory, lots and lots of data. Most of the data are about um, you know, intellectuals, writers, scientists. Uh, but you know, it goes like this, and the this the downward part of the curve, uh, where Arthur, you and I are solidly in, um, uh, you know, pretty abruptly ends at uh, 70 or, in a few cases, 75. And in a very few cases, you can get past 80. Um, and there's centuries of data on this. And so meaningful work is going to go down, and it's going to stop. Um, and you know, one thing that happens is meaningful relationships go up. Uh, you get different kinds of relationships, like grandchildren. Um, uh, and you know, I think that's important. But what really takes up a lot of the space ends up being, you know, games, uh, avocational interests, and the focus. Because meaningful work goes away, the focus of our lives becomes narrower and smaller uh, and smaller. And uh, it does begin to focus heavily on uh, these avocational interests, and particularly games. Um, and it seems to me that ratio. You know, I think most of us, we become, as we know, habituated to things no matter what. And part of what I was suggesting is we shouldn't become so habituated. We should step back. And as meaningful work goes down and games go up, we should be uh, dissatisfied with that kind of life. The second thing I would say is you notice that for all of those things to be meaningful, you actually have to have uh, reasonably good cognitive function. And the data on reasonably good co cognitive and, and physical functioning is pretty horrific, actually, if you actually sit back and look at it. Um, we are, we'll be lucky uh, because we are upper middle class, well-educated, and we know those all correlate with you know, actually doing better. But nonetheless, um, you know, Alzheimer's goes like this and goes like this. And the bend in the curve is uh, the inflection point is uh, 75. And, you know, somewhere between a third and half of people will have some form of Alzheimer's by 85. And, you know, that diminishes your meaningful life, your meaningful work, certainly if you're still capable of it. And even your avocational interests become very constricted. And it seems to me that if you step back, that's not the kind of life you want to, any of us want to lead. And yes, I was arguing to any of us. Um, and it wasn't just a, you know, particular preference. Good. Francis, do you want to comment on hey, that? Um, well, the thing is that when I read the article um, and when I read your question, right, y you, you asked Zeke, you know, does it mean that you think that people are making a moral mistake about whether there are objectively good things still in the aged person's life? And what you, Zeke, you've talked about a meaningful life. And I think that this is, for me, this was important in taking a perspective on your article because 
there's a view of what meaningful life involves. I take it, let's say, from Susan Wolf in her book, Meaning and Life and Its Importance. So the idea is that there are things that are worth, objectively worth doing. So this is, comes back to the objective goods, OK? And then there's the issue about attraction to the things that are objectively good. So, so let's say on Wolf's view, there, you could have a life of you know, objectively, objective goods that you never really care about. Okay, you're forced to do them by your society, and she doesn't think that's a meaningful life, or having meaning in life as you live it. Okay, but um, if you just are happy about things that are worthless, let's say you, your view about you know enjoying crossword puzzle, crossword puzzle, something like that. So if you think they're worthless, okay, um, you know uh, they're objectively the, worthless, Francis. The uh, <laughs> the okay the. Um, the, on your view, but OK, you, we have to argue about that, but OK. So you, you just have to identify the things that are worthwhile, and you need some arguments for them. But on her view, you know, um, being happy about things that are, you argument might show, worthless, right, is also not a meaning, having meaning in life, OK? So she gives the example of Sisyphus, who's, you know, just enjoying rolling his rock up and down, the god, you know. That's not necessarily meaning, having meaning in life. So the thing is that the way Zeke presents it, it, it could be the case, for example, that someone, let's say Einstein, who had developed the high-level physics, declines in old age to do uh, advanced bioethics, all right, to be the provost <laughs> of Penn, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, he says, look, uh, it's not that I'm denying the worth of this. It's just that given, you know, what I've done in my life previously, I can't get excited about, you know, bioethics, I, you know. So the thing is that it could be the case that when Zeke describes people who've been, and there's a lot of this term, vigorant and vibrous and in the head of their professions and advancing the, you know, knowledge, and they come to a level where they're, as you mentioned your father, reading. Maybe he's reading War and Peace. Maybe he's reading Ulysses. But all he's doing is reading. He used to be the head of his profession. You know, the comparative is going on here. Um, there's a decline. You keep on mentioning the decline. So Einstein was up here, and now he declines to bioethics. Right? It's not that bioethics itself is worthless. All right. A lot of people do it. They think it's worth. It, if, if, if they can argue that it's worthwhile, as you have. Um, but he, he Clara, <laughs> wait a second. I didn't make that argument. OK, just a minute, just a minute. But he, I do he, it doesn't mean I think ex, it's worthwhile. Excuse, excuse me. The thing is that the point I'm making is that it may be that in virtue of certain people's paths, they can't have that additional element of being attracted to something that's intrinsically worthwhile. And for those people, it may not, in fact, be worthwhile going on. But that doesn't mean that for a lot of other people, for example, these enterprises, let's say reading, right, are not an incline. Someone who's been backbreaking work, laboring work, OK, all his life, electrician or something of that sort, a plumber, whatever, now he can go you know, to a community college and read books that he's never had. There may be inclines for certain people. So a lot of the judgments you make are not about the worth of the things, but the ability to be attracted to them, I think. And that may be a function of where you were at your high point. So there's this comparative argument. The other thing that strikes me about the argument is that it has this quality about um, that some people talk about now, I think Atul Gawanda is an example, that life is a story and how you end really matters. And the idea is that somehow that if your end is a decline from where you were, right, that it somehow affects the value of the entire life. You may be engaging in something that's worthwhile and attracted to it, but in comparison to, you know, it's not adding significance to your life, even though it gives you meaning during your life, but as a product looking at your life. It's not uniformly at a heroic or high level or at the level that you would occupy. And the idea then is that, um, well, it's like, you know, this is, comes from Ronnie Dworkin as well. It's like a brilliant novel that has a not so good last chapter. It's not a bad last chapter. It just doesn't live up to the rest. It would have been better for the novel as a whole if it had ended before that last chapter. Because it just, but life is not a novel, you see. <laughs> A person's life is not a novel. It's a mistake to think of it as a story that has to has an ending that matches the rest of it so that it's uniform. And that you, 
you cut off your end as the way you would cut off the not so good chapter of a brilliant novel. I think that's a mistake. No, well, I, I mean, uh, let me say two things. First of all, in my- Two head. things? I'll bet he says more than that. <laughs> you, you keep count. I'll say four things, and if I stop at two, <laughs> We'll know I'll that, have won the, both sides we'll, of the bat. We'll know that Just the cognitive count. decline has set in. Yeah. It's definitely <laughs> set in. Uh, the first thing um, is uh, I have been accused of elitism. And I said meaningful work. And I don't believe that the only meaningful work is intellectual work. I think you can have meaningful work in lots of other areas. And I believe your electrician, uh, woodworkers, carpenters, car mechanics, lots of people can have meaningful work. So I don't take meaningful work only to be intellectual. Well, we I didn't do, accuse you of that. I didn't say anything. Well, you did suggest no. it. You contrasted what I was doing no. with, a, with an electrician for, no, uh, no, and no, I, no. Do I, think, I do think that, you know, we have data on the decline of intellectuals because it's easier to get their output and other things, but that's by no means uh, uh, um, the only group that I think can have meaningful work. Um, but I do actually think, and this will be my second point, that life is uh, very much like a novel. And it is about an arc. And it is about a, uh, uh, having a sequence and having the right periods uh, um, uh, or the right sequence of events. And I do think that a bad end does have uh, uh, repercussions, uh, especially for how people remember you and also how you yourself re remember it. One of the things that um, I have been struck by, uh, I don't know, has anyone mentioned? I'm an oncologist, so uh, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, caring for a lot of people who died. And how they died was enormously important to their family and to how their family remembered them uh, and survived. And the sequence was uh, where it happened uh, uh, mattered to people greatly. And I think to the extent that all of us care about how, our, uh, how we will be remembered by friends and family, um, there is an important element in which there is this last chapter. One of the most, um, I would say, problematic, and this I think will probably immediately move on to the next question, one of the most problematic deaths um, that I had was someone who ended up committing uh, suicide. Uh, with the medications they had. And the family was totally devastated by it because th it, they felt very much like they had somehow let this patient of mine down um, and uh, missed something and et cetera, et cetera. And it makes a huge difference, actually. And I don't think it's the case that we, uh, you know, it's just one damn thing after another, which is the implication that you've had, Francis. So, you know, it doesn't matter. You'll just add another chapter and another chapter, and the great parts will sing through, and the other parts will disappear That's or be forgotten. Very, very quick response, because we yeah, can't all I, have the last word all the time. I, I think that what I'm trying to emphasize is that a decline from whatever level one was at before is not necessarily an indication that you're not doing worthwhile things still. And I do think that. All endings, all I was saying was very, very bad endings. It may be the right to cut them short, even by suicide. And families should respect that choice, I think. That's something we'll come to. But the fact that an ending is not as good as the other parts, that's what I was saying. Still worthwhile things, reading, doing these other things that were not your profession. These sorts of things should not be eliminated because people will not remember you simply as uniformly great. I think that's somewhat, mm, forgive me, you know, vain or narcissistic. And I think the people who love you don't remember only the end. They remember the whole. And they, they love you, you know, in sickness and in health. So I think that so that it's has great. to be we're, we're, we're ending <laughs> on an empirical point, which there we're There are two problems resolved. there. <laughs> OK, OK, Zeke, the very quick last word on this exchange. No, oh, wait. OK, let's, no, no, you, you don't get <laughs> We could go words. on for, on this for we, a while, which is why we're still talking about it three years later. And, and this is why this is so much fun to be with uh, Zeke and um, Francis. But so, no, we no, shouldn't no. be. We new, should be getting answers, not new, endless talking. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> I thought I was right, though, Francis. Objectively so. New, related but new topic. Now, a question. Now, we'll start with Francis. So, so Francis, yeah. you, you have a pluralistic view of what the principles are for allocating uh, scarce medical resources. 
Uh, so it's not just one thing, but I, I do want to talk about one of your criteria, the criteria of need. And the way you understand need, which is, is very, very interesting, and Zeke actually shares this, is that it's the need of the, living a full um, lifespan. So one has more need uh, based on how one's life will have gone. Uh, and you call this um, will have hadism, which is a kind of a lovely Camian uh, phrase. And the way we should um, you know, distribute this idea of uh, address need, understood how somebody's, how badly somebody's life will have gone if one didn't get the, uh, the help, is um, a kind of prioritarianism. Again, that's not the only principle, there are the ones that, but with the idea being that we should allocate to that person first who has the most need, who whose will have had, under will have hadism is, is most needy, and that, all else being equal, would prioritize younger people over older people, uh, because younger people have not had a full lifespan, and older people presumably you know, already have had all the, mo many of the goods of, of a full lifespan. So that, that's, that I think is, and maybe ina inaccurate, but good enough um, account of your view. And it would follow from that, that um, all else being equal, when you have to allocate scarce resources between the young and the old, you would tend to prioritize the young. And if we get a little more specific, if we only have a billion dollars that forced choice it either has to go towards uh, saving the lives of young or the saving the lives of old, it would, should go to the young. And now, I actually don't think that there's any particular right percentage of GNP that should go to healthcare. If it turns out that the right moral principle suggests that we should spend half of GNP and stop buying fast you know, cars, that's fine. But presumably there are other very, very important needs, needs in justice that compete at the macro level with the needs of, um, of healthcare and saving people's lives. And so it's quite plausible, I think, that if we actually do attend to the various kinds of injustices in our society, the needs of children to be properly educated, the needs to fix our criminal justice system and pe give people access um, to um, the court system in the right kind of way, to take attention, pay attention to global warming, things like that, there were other very, very important things to spend our money on. And so our healthcare budget wouldn't be infinite. This is obviously not anything that's a surprise to you. So, uh, is it the case, Francis, that what the, one of the upshots of your view about what need is, and at least a soft prioritarian view about allocating need, that uh, it would be quite plausible that we could have a set of laws, public policies, that would rather strictly ration end-of-life care so that we would spend money on extending the life of the young and pretty much stop spending money, except on pa palliative care, of course, uh, on, ex on the elderly and simply call it Let's call it what is it? Ration, ration health the healthcare budget so that we stop paying for curative treatments for the elderly. W would that be an implication of your view? And if it is, is that well, is I, something you want to back? All I want to say is that first of all, um, at, when I talked about you know how should we ration resources, I wasn't discussing public policy. I no, was discussing weren't. moral theory. I know. Okay. And uh, so let me just say that from the point of view of moral theory, what I thought was important was that. There were various factors, all right? Oh, by the way, I'm just not talking about private life-saving resources that are scarce. I'm ta we're talking about public, yes. right? So if you own your own heart and lung machine that you build yourself or whatever, okay. Understood, right. yeah. So um, the thing is that uh, I thought that things like, you know, um, how much someone could benefit from in terms of outcome. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not opposed to forgetting about quality, so I'm not, People, there is this measurement, a quality adjusted life year, where you decide on how many years gone for quality. And I would rather leave the quality out of life and death decisions. So if someone is disabled, I don't think they should get a less, lesser chance. But I did think that um, uh, you know, people had paid attention to the idea of outcomes when allocating organs, for example. Is someone going to live for six months or five years if they get it? Okay, I thought that was relevant. Um, but I. People seem to always think of terms that the elderly or maybe have less right, and I won't say right, but their, their points allocated, right, because it's not a rights-based system. The only right you have in these systems for allocating is really to be given the proper amount of weight on each factor. That's the sort of right. That's true of the young and the old, okay? <clears throat> so uh, people always say, Things like, um, well, the older person won't live as long as the younger person will. But that's not always true, yep. right? So, but I thought that what was really important was to think about, you know, if someone has gotten a large piece of cake already, all right, 
to whom might you want to give more cake? The person who hasn't had any, all right, or hasn't had very much. Now, um, if someone has already had the benefit of many years of life, yep. okay, not in a coma and so forth, you've got to modify all this, right? Um, then uh, they will have had, it's always will have had at the point of death, right? Um, more than this younger person will have had if they die now, okay? And the point was that that's an independent factor that has nothing to do with the elderly not living as long, all right? So I thought, and as you say, it, it's not giving lexical priority, it's a weight, it's a factor, right, that should be taken account of. So uh, much as a young person wouldn't get the organ on my system if they would only live, let's say, for six months and an elderly person would live for 10 years, the point is that every additional year that the elderly person gets, right, is sort of multiplied by a divisible factor, right, or that the young person would get multiplied by an, an increasing factor, okay? It's a multiplicative weight system, okay? So it is true that sometimes the aged would get less um, you know, uh, uh, fewer points, right, for the value of the additional years in their life. And I think that makes sense. Um, but when you're drowning in a pond, okay, uh, and there aren't any conflicting individuals who have to be saved, you have as much right to be saved as anybody else if you're an elderly person. Now, the example of... I'm asking you to speculate about how this cashes out in public policy. That's right. Well, but the thing is that, but well, first I want to point out with your uh, other areas, you know, climate control, uh, resources, education. The thing is that um, I only considered, and this is a limitation of my book, all right, at the, what you're referring to, I think, where I lay out the system, uh, life-saving in different people. I didn't consider um, improving the quality of some people's lives versus saving other people's lives. And that's what you're talking about when you're talking about climate control and education versus healthcare. On the, that point, my impulse is to say that, first of all, the fact that there are many benefits doesn't mean that there are greater benefits. So, for example, we could build parks for young people, okay? Well, the way I think of it is, um, if any given person doesn't go to the park, you know, doesn't have a park to go to, is that as bad for them as someone else dying, even an older person? And I would ordinarily say, no, okay? Now you say, but there are millions of children, each of whom will not get to go to the park if we don't fund the money. And I'm an anti-aggregationist. I don't think that the fact that millions of people will lose out on a few minutes of pleasure, or maybe it's more than that, okay? is something that should weigh against a serious loss to an individual, for this individual who would die. So public policy people typically are aggregationists with a lot of ridiculous implications. Um, I'll give you an example. Okay, this is one that John Torek was fond of quoting. Um, uh, how many lives are lost by uh, or saved by having a lower speed level? Lower speed, okay. So apparently there was a calculation done that more lives are lost by lowering the speed. Uh, you know, I don't drive, so what is it called? The speed limit, right? Um, um, and uh, then are saved. Why is that? Well, it's true that there are fewer car accidents, but the amount of time they spend in traffic getting home, you know, are minutes lost from a good life. And if you calculate the total <laughs> number of people who lose those minutes of life, and it amounts to the number of minutes, you know, in a whole life, all right, and so many more people die. This is ridiculous, okay? <laughs> and this is one of the problems of aggregation. So I just want to give a warning. I don't have a complete answer to the public policy question because I wasn't thinking of it in those terms, but I don't think that simply by looking at small benefits to many people, you get an answer that outweighs the loss to elderly of their life. I, I, I was thinking of um, justice claims that uh, others have, and of course, I think on your scheme, you would actually compare non-life-saving but important justice claims to... Uh, justice might have a priority if you're a liberal and let's say a Rawlsian system. It's very much, very important, right, that people not 
be sentenced without a lawyer, for example, to life in prison or something of that sort. And that really could take priority over even a strong welfare interest like not losing your life. So there may be different types of situations, right? Zeke, you also have a priority um, element in I just want to notice it's May 5th, and you and I actually agree a lot on something, OK? What is May 5th happening? I don't know. We're here, and we agree a lot. So We've about a decade a ago, about a decade ago, uh, we did take on the issue where there really is rationing in the American yeah. healthcare Vaccines, system, yeah. organ transplantation, yeah. and uh, the allocation, God forbid, but pretty reliably, we'll have a flu pandemic sometime in uh, the remaining part of our lifetime, and we'll have a problem of allocating vaccines and um, medications and uh, other things. And so not with the big whole healthcare system, because that's too complicated for my small brain. Um, but in the actual case where we do on a regular basis ration, we, uh, I think, completely agreed. Uh, it's pluralistic. We identified eight different principles that might come into play. And we said that, you know, three of them are probably not ones you want to use, like uh, first come, first serve, or sick is first for a whole uh, series of reasons. But uh, at the core, we did think, and we did put it in prioritarian language, that you know, young people have uh, had the least of something, and the least of something is a long life, and they ought to get priority. We did not actually do it um, from you know, one-year-olds get more preference than two than three, because uh, we thought that you know, the actual top preference should be somewhere between 15 and 25 or 30. Um, for a whole series of, of reasons, um, and I, uh, I uh, you know, think that the loss of being able to live, lead a complete life is a high priority, and uh, you do then also consider things like prognosis, how many people you can save, and at least in the organ transplant case, that turns out to be a good argument against you know, not giving any individual person two organs, a liver and a kidney. Uh, if you can save uh, two different people, that, that ought to take priority uh, was uh, our view. Um, uh, my good friend Sarah Palin got a hold of this and called me the rationer in chief as a result, uh, that I wanted to kill all old people and, uh, and only save young people. Um, and uh, when she was asked, well, so how would you allocate it? She said, on the basis of need. This was her brilliant insight <laughs> uh, into how we actually should ration limited resources. Um, but, 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 but Zeke, I, oh, I, 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 want to, I, I want to press you on this because I, re I really want to move from, at least briefly, from um, how in a moment of time with a, an emergency with a scarce resource, how are you supposed to allocate, and, and you both actually have rather similar views. I want to move from that to what a general health care policy would look like. Uh, your brain is not too small to think about that. You've written two books about that, and you've advised two presidents about that. Um, well, the problem, is, the is, reason is, is, I is, don't is, do is that. Is it not the case that this will actually cash out You've been advising Trump as well as Obama. Is that the Sorry, Francis, but okay, yes. I didn't know. I just, you said two presidents. Would, would, I was would, surprised. Would, wouldn't this end up having certain features like the, the British national health system where when you get to be age X, you no longer get treatment Y? Well, I'm not sure that's true in Britain. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, it, 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 it's a good caricature of okay. Britain. Um, but I, and I'm not sure that, I mean, one of the reasons I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that is I, I think we're very, very, very far from right, fair that <laughs> problem. Um, and uh, so I'm not actually, uh, I'm preoccupied by other problems okay. that are more pressing. And that problem of are we going to have to ration care is a, um, in the current American healthcare system, or at least the, even in the American healthcare system that one can foresee, uh, um, is a pseudo problem due to other things. I will say, however, Arthur, unlike Francis, I do agree with you, I think, with your underlying question. Um, or at least I will state one of the reasons that I get exercised about American health care costs so much has almost nothing to do with American health care costs, and I really couldn't care. Uh, it has to do with the fact that it, it is a zero-sum game. From a, you know, anyone who spent literally five minutes in public policy knows it's a zero-sum game in some ways. Okay? And the, when I was in the Office of Management and Budget, you have a pot of money. 3.4 at that time trillion dollars, I think, was what we were spending. You know, and you've got to figure out, and you give it more. Yes, we can always increase the deficit, but that also is a, a big spending problem uh, settling our future generations. And so you do end up with this, what are we going to spend? 
States do this all the time because they can't run deficits. And one of the consequences of spending so much damn money on health care is the fact that we are literally robbing higher education and primary education. And that, I, uh, even if we were saving more people with health care, I do think that's an injustice. And I do think the quality of life of not educating people is a more severe uh, moral harm than uh, you know, if we couldn't uh, uh, spend all this more money uh, on health care. And so I, I do think that actually is a trade. Now, Francis is not going to be a public policy person because it seems to me it is literally impossible to be a public policy person unless you are willing to aggregate, because you are responsible for the entire population. And so you have to make some calculation about uh, across the population, and you have to, have to, have to aggregate. I, I can't imagine, Francis, what public policy would look like without aggregating. Look, all I was saying was you aggregate once you have comparable levels of severity of loss. Uh, you know, you don't, this is the old, uh, you know, argument between uh, consequentialists and non -con You don't aggregate headaches to billions of people to get, you know, I won't save someone's life to prevent millions and billions of headaches. So if you think really that the loss to someone of not having a good primary school education is much, you know, more severe, right, than the loss of, let's say, four years of life or three years of life to a person who's in their 80s, then you just... I'm not opposed to aggregating in those cases because I would, you know, think that uh, you've got comparable levels of severity and you've maybe got a greater number of people, just as I would say five lives versus one life. I first look at the comparable levels of severity and then I engage in aggregation. I'm just worried about not looking at that first question, which is done, as some philosophers say, pairwise. Is this loss to this individual comparable to the loss to this individual. And we have to decide that before we see how many individuals on this side are going to suffer that loss. So That's Fra Francis, I, th I, I, I think we agree on, I think. I might have been sure that's your view because it, 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 they don't have to be comparable losses. It's just that both losses have to be significant. They have to be over some threshold you, you, you have, of significance. You have, you have a, ra you have a right. range of cases where um, if 95 people would be paralyzed, that's uh, it. That that's actually it. might outweigh that's five it. people but that, dying. That's what I talked about. Paralyzed? Comparable, I didn't okay. say equal. Okay. And Fine. so the question then, there are various interesting things about transitivity or intransitivity that that complicates the matter, okay. right? But the simplest thing is, you know, life, you know, versus, you know, a headache or something. You see, well, no, no, yes, it's not. But in the that's an easy. That, but we that's don't a, aggregate. That's, that's the. That's but the that's point. an easy one. We sure. we agree because they're not. You haven't gotten over some threshold, but, you know, poor education that leads to limited thoughts, limited abilities uh, over a lifetime versus, li uh, you know, life and death. It does seem to me then we're beginning to get into things that are comparable in your language. And, that's, that's, um, I'm willing to argue good, you know, good. about but that, then, whether they are comparable. And then you start aggregating. That's the, the point that I wanted to make. With respect to having a law that says you may not give someone something, I think that ties the hands of people who actually want to have a more subtle approach. Well, what about outcome? What about so forth and so on? So I think that would be a problem with a law like that. All right, That's one issue with a law. And I do think in public policy, it, it, and here, one of my frustrations, but I think I don't know how to solve it, is you do end up, it's almost impossible to have this pluralism of values. You end up coning down on you know, one or two particular values that then become dominant. And I think that is, and, and here I would agree, that's how you end up with you know, qualities and quality-adjusted life years that do seem to take us into, in general, I think it actually works reasonably well. It does take us into circles about comparing, you know, tooth capping and appendicitis. Um, but, you know, if, as long as we can agree to solve that problem, we don't have a better system. And I do think what ha ends up happening in public policy is the pluralism ends up going away. And I don't know a way to solve that problem because we're not very good. We as human beings are not very good at wrestling with. Uh, uh, well, I provided a formula. Multiple if, if, uh, I, Maybe it doesn't work. I tried to provide a formula, actually, in the book. You know, I had a help of a mathematician who actually, you know, <laughs> if you give so much weight to this value and you multiply it by this and so forth. So if anybody wants to look at morality, mortality, volume one. <laughs> but uh, admittedly, and I know Starzl, you know, at Pittsburgh. I went to see him. He had a formula. You know, so people have tried to create a formula that could be easily applied, even by a computer that takes account of multiple factors. Some of us think that waiting like that is the last refuge of the scoundrel who 
doesn't want to think hard enough. Choose between your principles, Francis. Anyway, uh, sorry for that editorial comment. Question for Zeke now. We're actually going to start to move towards a topic that both of you have written a lot about and care about, um, various ways of uh, voluntarily ending one's death. So, so Zeke, um, I mean, you're, of course, aware of this. I mean, you hope for an early, easy death. But of course, that hope may not be fulfilled. You're, you're a rather healthy guy. And on your 75th birthday, you're probably not you know, the next day going to get a quick and easy pneumonia and die painlessly of it. Uh, almost certainly, you will decline and be diminished and suffer some disability. And it may take several years. Before, and even though you decline curative treatment, it may take several years. So um, I, I don't understand, on your view, why you aren't committed to you know, hastening the end, so to speak. And uh, well, why don't you commit your life to you know, you know, sacrificing your life to some important cause, you know, starting on your 75th birthday. Become an extreme plague doctor and expose yourself heroically to uh, infections, right? Um, or you know, care for the victims in the ruins of some Syrian village where you know, bombs are, are, are dropping. Or, or maybe more up your alley, you know, um, experiment on yourself with, with some kind of critical but fatal experiment to expand uh, knowledge. Or, or, I'm actually going to suggest I go to Mars on a one-way trip. There, 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 there you go. Or, or you know, go on a fatal hunger strike to protest misallocation of health care and, and deprivation of, of the, the poor. Um, or you can just go out and kind of blaze of achievement, you know, do a solo trek across uh, the Antarctic or you know, climb Everest without uh, oxygen. Or, um, or, or, you, or you can go to, go to, go to Mars. Uh, or Don Kilimanjaro, and it's pretty boring. I, I, I you know. take such pleasure oh, in thinking oh. of all these ways you could lead to <laughs> You see that? He's been thinking about this his whole life. How can Zeke die? (laughs) (laughs) Or or, or something very fitting for you. You could do death by crossword puzzle (laughs) and just do crossword puzzles until you're bored to death. Um, It would take one. But Zeke, you see where this is going. I mean, if none of the things appeal to you, why don't you just commit Suicide, and it wouldn't be physician-assisted suicide, because on my scheme, what you do, is, because that, that would cause all these institutions, and people think, oh, the great Zeke Emanuel is. So here's what you do. You simply resign your medical license the day before, on your birthday, so you're no longer a physician. So it's no longer a physician-assisted suicide. But just come up with a very, very painless way of bringing about the end that you very much want to bring about. So like, what, first, why, why first, first, of all, first of all, um, uh, I think, you know, Committing oneself uh, to doing something meaningful where the risks are higher uh, of uh, uh, injury and death. Yeah. Perfectly agreed with that. Um, and you should embrace you know, it. Well, and you should start on your No, no, I, 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 I've long before. Um, uh, I did buy a scooter the moment my kids, my last one, finished <laughs> high school, uh, college. Um, uh, so I, I'm. I actually am perfectly agreed that increasing risks and doing things that seem meaningful that might have higher risks that I might not have done before are things I actually already uh, totally uh, agree with and uh, perfectly fine. Um, I mean, intending your, I mean, really, tr- really well, I, I, about your death rather quickly yeah, I, I'm in, not, some bla- in some blaze of glory. Well, I'm not actually going to do that. And I don't, in part because I do, again, to go back to my, uh, the last chapter business. I think it actually makes a difference to, uh, would make a severe difference to my kids and other people uh, what, h- how I went out um, and what I did and was it a meaningful uh, uh, exit. Um, and um, so I think that actually is an overwhelming um, preoccupation of mine, if you want to uh, put it that way, because I do think how you live on uh, will uh, will be uh, extremely important. What, you know, what, what, on the assisted suicide thing, I think, you know, I, I've been uh, uh, quite clear for uh, low these uh, 25 years, which is um, it's a public policy. It's a crappy public policy. Um, uh, it gives lots of people reassurance that we're addressing the problem of end of life care when we're not addressing the end, problem of end of life care uh, by it. And more importantly, all the information we have about it. Uh, and the people who want it is false. Um, uh, Your mental picture of it is false. um, And the public's mental picture more generally is false. And I think the idea of pushing it as a public policy because it's going to help people who are severely suffering uh, or uh, of physical uh, uh, pain and other physical symptoms is just 
wrong. I mean, it's it, physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia look just a whole lot like suicide, um, and we've dressed it up. Uh, and I don't think our response to that ought to be, oh, here's a you know prescription for pills, um, or here's a suicide machine, and I I'm willing to help you. But, but, uh, that but, seems but, to me just the the wrong answer uh, to the. Uh, problem we have. Before we get into the institution of physician assistant suicide, uh, and I do know your objections are you know, in application institutions, what's, what, how it's going to play out, uh, I don't understand your objection to suicide simply, the suicide of a rational, competent, because I got non depressed 75 year old. Um, you say how you go out is important, but I don't see why going out of a curable pneumonia is somehow better for you, your reputation, your children than having a grand 75, 75th birthday celebration and then with, ev with everyone's, you know, actually processing it endlessly with your family, uh, having a ceremony where you then painlessly off yourself. I don't see why that, is not, that doesn't follow from your view. Well, first of all, I have no idea when the pneumonia is going to happen or no. the myocardial infarction or whatever it's no. going to be. And I'm perfectly, I, I mean, I'm perfectly content to live after 75. The article didn't say, you know, 75 is all. Um, and as I, I think why I, I hope I, to die at 75. Oh, that, that was the editor. That wasn't you. Why I hope to die at 75. Well, and if you read actually the end of the article, <laughs> I was pretty clear okay. about that. In part because, as I acknowledge in the article, there is a distribution. Um, I have no idea where I'll be on okay. uh, that distribution. Um, you know, and I don't. What I'm not going to do is prolong my life. What I wa don't want to do is take a lot of steps to just get that next uh, um, year uh, or live to some number like 100 just because it's 100. It seems to me, again, going back to what I said earlier, it depends upon ha being able to have meaningful activities, uh, uh, meaningful relationships. Um, and you know, that is uh, the important uh, criteria. Francis? Well, um, one thing I want to ask you is suppose that, I mean, you worried about not being able to function at a reasonable level and having meaningful activities and so forth and not just playing games and so forth. But suppose that you felt it coming on that you were declining relative to what you think of as, you know, worthwhile that you are attracted to given your. So then a doctor comes to you and says, look, I've got this drug that will pep you up and make you vibrant. And you notice, you'll notice that your mental functioning gets better and that you can actually engage in things, right? Yeah. But you, you'd like a drug like that, I gather. Yeah. But then they tell you, look, it's It'll a It'll shorten your life? It's a foreseen side effect that, you know, this will put stress on your heart. Like, you know, some people like human growth hormone and they think, um, and, you know, Instead of uh, the flu, you know, I mean, would you, would you object Francis, to Francis, as I just said, like I, I, I've already, I've already right. increased my risk, and I'm willing to increase my risk level for meaningful activities. OK. Uh, this is like not a dilemma. Oh, right. Good, good. This is good. This is, the que this is the question I had. Because you never actually answered or brought up that issue in the article. I was sort of surprised. So if you're willing to Have take a drug. Have you ever written drug, for an, a magazine? There are yes, things called yes. word limits. Yeah. Well, okay. The you thing can't is, answer all questions that Francis would like answered. Okay. The reason it's important, all right, for me as a philosopher is because if someone is willing to take a drug that will help them avoid the diminished activity levels and so forth, though it is foreseen, not just risk, it's foreseen with certainty that this is going to put your, you're going to, you know, end your life quite soon. When otherwise you would have been in diminished condition, as you put it, stooped and babbling and you know, so forth and so on. Doing crossword and you wouldn't, Right, we're doing crossword. <laughs> so the thing is that if th this has the parallel to the idea that if you're willing to do something to you know, avoid be something bad, though death will come as a foreseen consequence, this indicates that you're taking death to be the lesser of the evils, right? You just want to avoid being stooped and stupid and so forth. You really want to be able to be fully functioning. Now, you've already said that you're OK with intending your death, because you say you're not going to take the flu shot. You're going to refrain from saving yourself, 
with the intention that you die, not just foreseen, with the intention. Oh, no, no. You that's said, not what I, I hope to die. I know. No, that's not what I said. To die? That's not what I said. Well, are you okay? I mean, not every part. Again, Francis, All you're a philosopher. You're a yeah. philosopher. And Forgive you're like me. That. Forgive me. No, well, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> one consequence is you, you put a lot of emphasis on this word certainty. And last I looked, Certainty in life. The, the, the one certainty, I'm sure. The, the argument well, is just parallel. Well, to, no, no, no. The one certainty is, yes, going to Mars is a one-way trip. It's not a return visit. Okay? okay. Uh, and you would die. But most of medicine, Look, all of medicine, that kind of certainty doesn't actually work. Most drugs, they're not going to certainly kill you. Um, and that but, doesn't work. And so the same thing is I, true of pneumonia. May I just say that... In the article, you said, I intend to not take this medication when I, in the flu, all right? With the intention and with the hope, you say. I mean, I don't have the article I in front of me. I actually don't say that. Yeah, well, you say that the reason that you're taking the medic, not taking the medication is because you will die. It's not that you're not taking oh. it because, excuse me, it's not, you say, you don't say, this is such a burdensome procedure to take this flu shot that I don't want to go through it despite the fact that I'll die. You say, it's very easy and it's certain to prevent my death. The reason I don't take it is because I don't want to go on living. Francis, That's the reason. Francis. Let me just finish the... But you're misquoting me just very no, severely, I'm not. Francis. I'm not misquoting you. But the, all right, let's just say uh, that Then I've somebody... changed my ma mind, Francis, over the last three years. Okay. And you're the only person who knew what my mind was three years ago. What I said, okay, yeah. is I will not take an intervention where the purpose of the intervention, the justification of the intervention right. is going to prolong my life. I did not say the reverse, which is the reason I'm not taking the flu shot is because I want to die. The reason I'm not taking the antibiotics is because I want to die. I recognize, maybe unlike you, that there is no 100% if you get pneumonia. Lots of people in the pre-antibiotic era got pneumonia and survived. Right. Similarly with the flu, okay? I'm not saying that I will not, okay? I want to die. What I said is I am not doing something with it, or the justification for that doing it, it uh, uh, that medical intervention is to live. Those, I believe, are different things. I Francis, think, quick reply, okay. and then we're going to open up to questions. Okay. All I want to emphasize is that if someone says, I'm willing to take a drug that will keep me active, though I foresee that it will kill me, and someone says, I'm not taking the flu shot, I'm not taking the colonoscopy because they have a chance of increasing my life. And it's not because they're burdensome. My sense is that that person is intending his death, right? And thinks it's a good thing that they die because they want to avoid being in decline. If you combine the willingness to do something to yourself that will kill you, foreseeably, with it being okay, per se, to intend the death, then I don't see why you can't combine, and this is the philosopher in me looking for the argument, trying to convince people, to combine killing, namely doing something that will bring about your death, with the intention to die. So that's, you know, trying to get an argument, right, out of what you're saying, and how someone may reasonably, I think, interpret what you were doing, you know, intending to die, and now answering this question, which you didn't raise because of limits of time, would I take a drug that foreseeably kills me? So this is the way you might construct an argument. Okay. Hold it right there. We're going to open up the questions. But here, I will, I will, I'm not a strict prioritarian, but I will give priority right now to questions that involve either this foreseeing intending distinction or our questions about uh, physician-assisted suicide. So let's take first questions about that. Seeing. Yeah. So I would like to question the idea of a bad end. So um, I have worked for almost 20 years in healthcare as a bioethicist um, and many other aspects. And I think there's a, big, a wide plurality in how we might consider the end. So many people, for example, we might say suffering and horrible you know, uh, things would be a bad end. But to some people, that actually is a meaningful part of their end. And um, so I, you know, I question this idea of, you know, the end of the book or, you know, these horrible sort of 
interventions might be you know, harming a family or in many ways, because I actually think that some people find great meaning in the suffering, or in, it may be unusual for some of us. But um, that's something I think that's very important. Um, and so even if a person is extending their life in these horrible ways that we might perceive it, I'm not so sure that that's an argument for that being a bad section or a bad part of their ending to their life. I don't know that I said that people couldn't um, uh, perceive having suffering uh, at the end of their life as part of a good ending. Most of the people I know that isn't true. They don't view this as uh, in that uh, way. And I would actually, uh, people who view it as sort of uh, a necessary part that they have to suffer they have to have pain or some other, uh, you know, severe dyspnea uh, uh, as somehow ennobling of the end. Uh, I would want to reason with them as to why they think that's true, um, but I don't automatically think, and I don't think I uh, uh, suggested uh, that that would necessarily be a bad end. I do think, for the vast majority of people, and I'm not here. I don't know whether I would say everyone. Um, but it ought to be the case that an end where we are uh, not cognitively present, uh, where we are uh, imposing a burden on our relatives, is a bad end, objectively speaking. I don't think there's a problem there. And you know, again, uh, if you're cognitively impaired, it's very hard to have uh, uh, meaningful uh, interactions and meaningful activities. Um, and if you're a burden on uh, your relatives, um, uh, through the physical decline and or mental decline. Uh, it also is, a, I think, a real problem. And I've rarely seen people, except out of spite, saying, you know, I really want to be a burden to my relatives. And, and that almost inevitably means, uh, in, mo in most cases, my uh, female relatives, whether daughters or spouses or children, uh, their daughter-in-laws. Um, so I, I just don't see that as you know, a good death, and I do think it's a bad chapter at the end of a life that almost no one uh, wants, and those people who want it, I think, are misguided, and you need to reason with them. Well, I think one thing I would specifically refer to is the literature that looks at racial and ethnic differences, specifically uh, Richard Payne's work and others, who have found that sort of there's a, a certain sp perspective of the good death, but that good death is not necessarily held by um, a wide variety of people. Yeah, may I, I just want to say that I even think that when one realizes one is a burden on one's loved ones, one should first find out whether the loved ones really feel it as a burden or they feel that it's an honor to be able to take care of someone they love uh, and not to assume that your view that I'm burdening you <coughs> is the way they're looking at this situation. I really think that's very important. Can I just ask a question? No. Alec. So there it is. <laughs> I was going to project. Um, so I also want to talk about the, the bad last chapter idea. And it seems to me that there's an important distinction that maybe it's in your work and I haven't seen it, or maybe it isn't, but I want to bring this, bring this distinction in. It's between a kind of moral monstrosity that one might show at the end, uh, the opposite of a kind of redemptive move that you know, some, t some writers like to talk about. And that might cast a pall over everything because if some moral monstrosity is demonstrated at the end, then you reinterpret everything that's happened before, as opposed to just a simple degradation where it doesn't cause you to reinterpret. I'm going to actually now relate a couple personal family stories to, to illustrate the point. My father's father, uh, towards the end of his life, he had a bad fall, he got a subdermal hematoma, his brain was quite compressed. He was intellectually very diminished after that. Um, my, my grandmother once asked him, Mickey, why don't you talk? He said, I have no thoughts, right? But he continued on for many years in that capacity, and they were actually in a very meaningful relationship right up to the end. She died shortly after he died because living to be with him was part of what it was about. But he had been a very successful lawyer, right? And that was all gone in the last five, 10 years of his life. Um, he was reduced to a level of, in some sense, a very small child, right? He took pleasure just in the very concrete things. Mmm, that's a good brownie, 
right? Um, but that seems to me to be okay. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from my sense that this was a man who was a very good lawyer, witty, loyal. He just, in the end, was diminished. And again, so that seems to me completely different. It does, it, I don't get, and this is sort of in support of Francis's point, the idea that the last chapter somehow changes the narrative. Yeah, I, I think that what that ends up, especially if you've got five or 10 years of that, uh, severely blots out what happened before. That's what ends up dominating the memory of uh, relatives. That's what ends up, uh, you have to, the initial uh, recollection of a person is that diminished one, and then you have to work hard to remember the other things that you uh, ended up treasuring about them. Uh, and it does seem to me that, it, you know, uh, if I were him, that's not the life I would like to lead, and I would not like to lead it for five or ten years, and I would not like to have my relatives uh, maintain me or, or do other interventions. Um, Zeke, so. you, are, you are data driven. I mean, would it, could evidence actually change your mind about this? I mean, suppo no. suppo suppo well, what's the evidence? What, what well, evidence well, are you going to get? The, the, the evidence that well, your loved ones <laughs> actually don't remember you uh, right. in a negative kind of way. That the yeah, but I think most of what we know about memory like that is just the opposite, uh, right? Okay, that the end bit is what we do remember, and it does cast the, pa the uh, okay. pile forward. Yeah, over there. Uh, some references, and I love your comments. This week's Economist has a Kaiser Family Foundation poll in which death is compared in Italy, Japan, the United States, and I forget the fourth country. Maybe Australia, but I'm not sure. Uh, the way of avoiding a bad death is not going to the hospital. And I re re strongly recommend Frederick Wiseman's film of 30 years ago called Near Death, which talks about the reality of family, doctor, and patient interacting with each other. The patient is the one who has the least say because the patient is the sick person who has no, barely energy and wit to do this. And this is far more of a problem for the f medical profession and this is, was pre-palliative care. You haven't discussed palliative care. You haven't discussed any of the ways that creative people have made death more manageable, more humane, and a better thing to look forward to. And by the way, we're in our mid-80s, and your 75 is a nonsense. <laughs> I don't, look, I mean, you know, I, I've spent 30 years trying to improve end-of-life care in this country, um, and uh, I think uh, I've done a reasonable job um, in almost all the areas uh, that you mentioned. Um, you know, I was one of the first people to talk about the fact that patients actually wanted to be engaged in this discussion, spent a lot of time trying to get the American uh, uh, medical profession to move people out of the hospital. Uh, and, you know, I'm also one of these people who likes to see things half full. We've actually done a remarkable job in this country actually improving end-of-life care over the last 30 years. When I started out in oncology, I don't know, 60% of cancer patients died in the hospital, and today it's uh, about 20%. Um, it's still not perfect. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, to do. Um, and uh, uh, I think we've done a remarkably uh, good job, um, there's, as, as I said. Um, and regarding palliative care, um, you know, what can I say? I've been there. Uh, I've worked on it. I've tried to disseminate it across the country. Um, I'm working with a uh, company that's actually implementing the right things, trying to show uh, that they actually, by bringing it up, stream or intervening early, we can actually do much better by patients and much better uh, by the healthcare system. But it doesn't change the inevitable. We are going to die. The question we face is, what does that last phase look like and what's it, uh, how do we write it? Um, and what's the sequence? We are going to be debilitated. No two questions about it, unless you die very quickly from a heart attack 
or a myocardial infarction or a car accident, uh, a, a heart attack or a stroke or a car accident. Uh, and even with those, uh, the deaths from the acute deaths from those have been going down dramatically thanks to interventions. Um, you know, you end up with uh, debilities, um, whether it's you know pain or insomnia or fatigue or nausea, vomiting or dyspnea or whatever. And the question is, how do you want that to look uh, at the end? And what you almost inevitably find out in that sequence is people begin to shrink their lives. They do not step back and say, is this worth it to me? Now, if it's going on and you can engage, as I said, in some meaningful work, meaningful relationships, and meaningful uh, non-game avocational interests, I don't have any problem with that. Could I right? just? What I do have a problem with, and what I do think we over discuss is, all right, we diminish on all these parameters, right? We can't even think any higher level thoughts, and we think that's worth it? I just don't see it. Uh, I just wanted to say that, again, I think that some important distinctions. The philosopher Bernard Williams distinguished between having hypothetical goods, or hap desi hypothetical desires, as he called them. I'll speak of goods. These are the goods that you have that, if you are alive, you want to have, like not being in pain, or having some projects that keep you out of boredom. And a lot of palliative care is about that. Okay? But there's another form of desire, and it's called a, a categorical desire. You want to have things in life that give you a reason to go on living, things that you want to do such that you need life in order to do them, as opposed to, given that I'm going to be alive, I better not be in pain, I better not be bored, and so forth. I mean, not being in pain and not being bored is not the sort of thing that you want to go on in life <laughs> to have, you see? And I think this distinction between the hypothetical and the categorical is very helpful in thinking about what palliation does. Now, many people think, and I take Atul Gawan as an example, that it's very easy to give people meaningful lives. All they want, he says in one sec section of his book, is a little autonomy and some relationships. Zeke has a different view about the goods that make you want to go on living. Okay? I don't agree with his view. I think there are many worthwhile things that can still be done and that one can be attracted to, even though they're not as good as the things one al already has accomplished. But you have to keep in mind this distinction. Do you want to go on for these things, as opposed to, given that I'm not going, that I am going on, that they won't let me commit suicide, you know, whatever, thanks to Zeke, <laughs> uh, I've got to have these things. And I think that's a very important thing to consider, independent of whether you decide with Zeke that what he thinks gives meaning to life is the only thing that will make you go on. Meira and then uh, Yuli. The discussion in some ways has come to what I wanted to ask about, which was to pick up on Francis's points about diminishment. Uh, Francis didn't quite press it in this way, but what I'm curious about is the extent to which it is, as she put it, the comparative loss for an individual that has moral status for you, because one of the ways, say, to reframe slightly one of her examples, so um, if there are, Let's say there are two people, me, somebody else. Um, I currently knit as a way of using up some cognitive function so that then I concentrate on what's being said and I don't doodle and I don't start to think about my email. But let's say now, you know, when I'm 80, knitting actually takes all of my cognitive function and it's simply, you know, what keeps me focused. Somebody else right now spends her time knitting and that takes all of her focus at age 40, right? Um, I assume that we would not say that she is leading a life that's not worth living. Let's say she has a job, unlike me, which serves to pay the bills, but in which she does not find intrinsic fulfillment. And she has a range of relationships that are meaningful to her, but not as many or as deep relationships as I have. Now, I end up like her at age 80. That will be a significant diminishment of my life, but so long as we would not say of her at, you know, in her adulthood, that she is leading a life that is not, in fact, worth living, it's not, I'm curious then, why does the comparative 
uh, status actually gain moral traction? No, I actually don't think the comparative status gains moral traction. I don't think what Francis said and tried to attribute to me is actually what I believe. I don't think it's just because Einstein once did this and, you know, I actually think we we, uh, uh, go below a threshold and it's the below the threshold. I mean, almost anyone who, know, who knows me knows that it's, I'm all about thresholds. I'm not about comparative before and afters. It's really about the threshold. And it seems to me, uh, you know, knitting is a, is a, uh, it's a creative uh, kind of thing. You, you've, got, you've used a good example. If you had used the, uh, my, my crossword Crosswords, puzzle right. example, it would have yeah. been a completely, yeah. no, and I do think there are completely different kinds of activities. And I do think part of that, uh, um, one is a game, right? If she got pleasure only playing Scrabble or something, that I do think there's a problem there. Or only playing video games, I do think there's a problem there. Knitting is a very different kind of activity. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, it's a creative activity. It's got a lot of, you know, focus uh, on it. And I, I think there's a very different kind of meaning that you uh, can see in those kinds of activities. And so I don't actually, I, I, and I, I don't think anything I said uh, so you think so I don't think just... anything I said uh, had this sort of delta. It's because okay. Einstein was once Einstein, and then he went on to mere bioethics that there was the problem. I just think the problem is the mere bioethics fell below a threshold. Okay, well, I, I actually think that in the article you talk about your father, you know, he was once a leader in the community and in professional circles and so forth, and now he's sort of slow and sluggish and he sits and reads. That the yes, comparison. that's the problem. You mean a life where someone is always reading books is a bad life? If that's only all the thing you're doing, it's not sufficient, yes. Oh my oh gosh. Boy. <laughs> Bo- books, are, <laughs> books are part of a bigger life if that's all you're doing. And I was very specific. Uh, all you're doing. I think I, I, it's I, not. I, I'm going to have to start trekking in I, Antarctica tomorrow, Zeke. Um, no, really. trekking in Antarctica is not meaningful. I just want to tie this debate again to the public policy debate. Because it seems that. Uh, Which public policy debate? The one that you had about aggregation and, oh, and resources. Yeah. Of course, you're a government official. Yeah, what can I do? A former government <laughs> official. <laughs> That's true. Um, and sitting in a lot of committees that have to allocate resources, I, I take your position that it's always a zero-sum gain. So here's my, here is the question. Um, taking into account that we are going in the future to invest a lot of money to keep elderly people alive, um, how do we value that in comparison, or how do you, we calculate it in comparison to other types of investment in health? And the thing, that m- for me, the most interesting one is prevention. Because when you sit on these committees, the way they work, it's always people come to the committee to put forward their position, or the position of somebody they love. So you see a suffering person, and then the tendency, the emotional tendency, not the rational tendency, is to put a lot of money to help them continue living, even if it's a very short life. And you don't see the people that are not going to be infected by something because you take preventive acts. So I think these debates are usually not actually taking uh, priority in healthcare. And I wonder what you think, Francis, on the aggregative part of that. On minor issues, okay, vaccinating uh, children not to get diarrhea. Most children don't die from diarrhea, but they do suffer a lot. Against really cal- helping people at the last stage of their life have a little bit more well-being. So it's, you can't say both are good. I mean, both are good, but you can't say do both because there's a limited amount of resource. Right. Are you willing to say that one thing yeah. is better than the other? Well, first of all, I, you know, I, I, I think that con- con- conceptual clarity can be important here. A lot of people, some people at least, think that the distinction between treatment and prevention is not that you see this poor suffering person, right, and you're overtaken by your emotions and you don't see all the others you know, who you could prevent. It's rather that there's a concentration of risk of death in this one person. Let's suppose they're going to die, right, um, if you don't take care of them now. There could be many more people who will die because you don't prevent, right? But the probability at this point of any given person amongst those many being one of those who will die is very small. Now, 
that's the idea. You say not every child will die of the diarrhea. I just want to point this out, OK, that this is not necessarily emotion taking over. It's dispersion of risk or, again, comparison. This person and this person and this person and this person, all these people who are facing the threat of, the di or of dying right, in the future that we could prevent, not all of them will die. right? Each one now has a small probability of being one of those many who will die. This person here now has 100% probability of dying if we don't save him. That's another way of looking at the distinction between treatment and, and uh, prevention, and why we might think that we have some obligation to treat rather than only look at the number of total people who will be saved if we prevent versus whether we treat. I just want to make that point. That doesn't mean that when the numbers of people who will die, uh, in my opinion, right, even if you accept this alternative way of looking at the issue, then the numbers of people who will die are very large, okay, that you oughtn't to invest in prevention, especially when, and I want to put my finger on the scale here in this prioritarian way, when they would otherwise lose a great deal of life when other people will have had already a great deal of life. But I do think that I first wanted to clarify that there are other ways of looking at treatment and prevention beside the way that you present it. Zeke, you agree? Well, I mean, it, it seems to me if you look at the principles that we would uh, accept, um, this it, one of the worst principles to allocate on is sickest first. Just give it to the sickest. Right, I agree. Uh, and I think it, it turns out that in um, the medical system, we do this all the time, right? I mean, what happens in the emergency room? Well, you're, you're sewing up a laceration or you're taking care of someone, and someone comes in with multiple gunshot wounds. Prognosis goes out the window, sick is first, and we just all rush there where I think what, we're, what we would say is, you know, we ought to look at prognosis of uh, but that's a different earth that she's talking about, because let, let prognosis, me. you know, uh, as, as in the past. No, it is, it, it, it is related, because where prognosis here is the number of life years you're going to save in an elderly patient, even if you get them over this hump, there's a limited number of life years beyond, whereas on the kids, uh, you know, you might save one or two, and there is 70 years uh, beyond that. And it does seem to me that's what, you know, it turns out, if you ask most people, prognosis way outweighs the sickest first. But when we're actually in the heat of the moment, sickest first because it's easily, di easily determined and um, not actually the principle we most endorse. I, but I just want to say that care about outcome is different than care about what someone will have had. Because it could be that the younger person will only give you, you know, six months. We agree months. that it's multifactorial okay. and caring about right. okay. it's just a, a living a, no, a complete life is important. We, uh, Howard, please. <laughs> this is probably the last question. I saw lots of hands. We finally got riled up here. But I think this is going to be the last question. Well, the, the philosophical discussion is, is interesting and important. But um, there are two kinds of data that I would most want to know before taking on Zeke's position. One is, what do the different stakeholders think? You yourself, but also your family, the people who are likely to be caretakers, and not so much the people who write the obituary or biography. I think that seems to be looming too large in your own mind. But second of all, how do these discussions change over time? As somebody who's very close to the threshold that you described, um, if I had made decisions early on um, with having endorsed your notion, I would have made very different kinds of decisions. And I think so. This isn't something where you should sign a piece of paper. I think it's got to be an ongoing dialogue with those closest to you and with yourself. Thank you, Howard. So t uh, let me make two points. Um, I know it doesn't come out in the article, um, but the actual people I'm writing for are not the 75-year-olds. They're actually the 25-year-olds who are trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives. That actually, ironically, was my main focus. Um, because I think thinking about what's going to happen at 75 is really important for deciding what you're going to do at 25. And I think we undervalue that because we discount the future and we always think, young kids, it's really impossible for them to think that they're going to be 75. Um, and I, I think it ought to heavily influence what they're going to do, what that arc uh, looks like. Um, and I think knowing that there's a definitive uh, end point um, and uh, uh, the term paper comes to an end is a very important thing in thinking about a life. And I totally agree with you. One of the problems of 
reassessing every moment is we have this tendency, which we already know of accommodation, you know, where something happens, diminishes our uh, purview, and we become happy with that. We can become happy, you know, what, what do they say, you know, very limited life, just like a pig. Um, and it seems to me that's a problem, not something to be celebrated, okay? The second thing I would say is, um, you know, if you do look, and we have, you know, part of what I've done is to look at caregivers who spend a lot of time care, caring for, I didn't look at um, Alzheimer's patients, but that also there's a lot of data about the burden of that. Uh, but there is a lot of burden on family members caring for dying patients. Um, it is non-trivial. Uh, um, now, lots of people were inculcated not to complain about it. Um, and it turns out that, and again, it's very sexist because it's predominantly gets shoved on women. Three quarters of all caregivers are women, um, and it does severely cramp their uh, activities. And I think, you know, the natural tendency of my daughters to say to me, you know, is, okay, go, go early. Um, that's their natural tendency. But, uh, <laughs> um, and by the way, my brothers think that 75 is way too long, way too long. 70 is more accurate. Um, no, I think, I think the fact of the matter is we are, you know, if you ask them, they say, no, of course it won't be a burden, but of course it will be a burden. Um, and the more severely impaired you are, cognitively and physically, the more of a burden it is. Um, but, you know, we often assume those burdens. I think the difference between kids and adults is you assume the burden for your children because they're going to come, you know, they're all potential, and they're going to come up and flourish. That ain't going to happen with your, when I become an old uh, a uh, dying person. It's just not. So I will have the last word, but first I'll give Francis the next to last word. Okay. All I want to say was that what I took from your question was that um, the new approach is very much to have, and the conversation project in Boston is part of this, always have this conversation early enough. Don't wait till you're at the end of your life, you know, because who knows, you're in pressure circumstances. Do it in advance when you're calm and you're thinking about the value of life and so forth and so on, and write something like an advance directive or let your relatives know. But they also emphasize that your views may change as you go along. And the danger is, the danger that Zeke is pointing to is that you will accommodate, right? You'll be happy with the things that are truly worthless, all right? Extreme examples, you just enjoy eating your feces now. You get a lot of happiness out of it, okay? And he would say, well, there's something wrong with you. I don't attribute that to reading, okay? But in any case, <laughs> um, so the, the question is, you know, and it's an important question, Whose opinion do you take when you were fully competent, right, and had high expectations or demands on yourself, or the later person? And I don't think that answer, you know, is available to us yet. But I do think that, um, you know, there, there is an important issue about whether you want your earlier self, right, to decide about this. When Zeke discusses this briefly in his article, he says, I reserve the right to change my mind, okay? But he says, if I'm still creative enough to construct an argument against what I said back in that article, that will indicate that I'm an outlier and it's okay to go on, okay? So he's got the same standard, you know, am I continuing to be creative? And he wants to avoid any other justification. So he might have it in his will. You know, if I start giving the accommodation, you know, I'm just happy with, you know, feces. Don't, you know, don't listen to me. Don't give me the flu shot or something. Um, but if I'm creative, okay, and I will be available still to then rewrite my will. You see? So there, there's a, 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 a one way of approaching this issue of, you know, before or later. Zeke has appealed yeah. for one more sentence. He wants extended time. No, 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 no. It's, just, uh, it, it's <laughs> great to have this discussion in Cambridge. With me? You're because, kidding me, really? Because if we were in Silicon Valley, <laughs> we would have spent before. all our time talking about immortality. Because all they care about <laughs> is living forever, as if the world would be terrible if they died out there in Silicon Valley, in good and we never heard from them again. But in good condition. They want to so, live in good condition. Those, it's a very different conversation on the East Coast and West Coast. Very different. Those of you who have been fellows understand what it's like to spend one afternoon a week for a year 
talking with people like Francis and Zeke. Uh, those of you who have not had the fortune to have Bee Fellows now, now have a little taste of what uh, we've been doing for 30 years in the Ethics Center. Um, thank you so much, Zeke, and thank you so much, Francis. The conversation continues. <laughs>